And so it's really nice that she came out here tonight for the event. Um, I am Emily Carey, and I'm your so the idea for this poetry reading came from Joseph Safi of Art and Design um, here at SAU, who is also one of the coordinators along with uh, Brittany Tillis over there, uh, for our annual theme this year, which is Rebuilding Community. And um, this reading tonight brings together the SAU community and the broader Cloud Cities community by way of the Midwest Friday. Which is a community nonprofit that, that supports writers and fosters appreciation of the written word. And if you don't know about the Midwest Writing Center, you're going to hear a little bit about it tonight from the throughout the meeting. And I also think that I'd be here tonight no matter what, because I love poetry and whether I'm up on stage or out for the audience, all of you. But I feel really excited to be here hosting you tonight because we could make like a Venn diagram of like SAU community and like Quad Cities community and poetry, I would like right in the middle with my connection to SAU as an English professor here and the voting center, my involvement um, with them on the board and the programming committee. So, the poetry is just to me, not just poetry, but I'm going to say poetry too. Quiet. Poetry is there. Uh, so there's three quick things that I want to do before we introduce our readers and get the reading started. And first, I just want to thank uh, Joseph and Brittany uh, for including this event in the fall lineup of the best of the annual team. Um, and especially Joseph, who I know went far out of his way to make a beautiful uh, little broadside to the featured readers. You can see them out. Check out the next one. You can see them out on the table right outside. Um, In no particular order, but they're also unique. They feature words from the poems of our three readers tonight, and you can get them for five dollars each um, out front there. You know, proceeds will go to the community of West Side. So, if you want to pass them over to the mid run, and they're very cool. Um, so, thank you, Joseph, for that. And thank you, Joseph, and Brittany, for it. That's thing one. Thing two, and you can probably see this in the same piece. Um, I want to thank uh, Ryan Collins and all the folks in the Midwest Writing Center, um, including uh, Sarah, who is somewhere here. Oh, oh, there she is. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Sarah, um, for all the creating all these opportunities for writers in the area to develop their craft, to share their work uh, with audiences like all of you. Um, and a whole lot of other writers. You've got Elena involved and Aubrey. And so really thank you so much for that. Um, and there's a whole lot of other authors who are not here tonight, so I'll kind of use them tonight, who are included in uh, an anthology that just came out from the Midwest Writing Center that's called These Interesting Times, um, Surviving 2020 in the Quad Cities. So thinking about the whole year of 2020 and how it really was a year to survive. <laughs> Right, so it's a beautiful book, also for sale out front. So you can a copy that is like super hot off the press. I just picked up the copy, so you can get first pair. It's a beautiful book. Um, and also, we have copies of chapbooks in the book starting out front, too. One of which is Aubrey. And Aubrey's one of our readers tonight. So when you hear her reading her poetry, you're going to want it. <laughs> I promise you. The books are beautiful, the poetry is beautiful. They, Look great on your bookshelf or your business drawer or whatever. <laughs> but they've got some copies of those if you're so inclined. Um, so thank you to the Midwest Writing Center. These are the most talented and generous people that you could ever hope to meet. So it's a, a real treat to have everybody here tonight in honor of these institutions. Um, so the third thing that I want to do. Tonight is just to kick things off with a poem. Uh, but I thought it fit the rebuilding community theme perfectly. It's not one of my poems. My poems tend to be like, kind of sad and dark. And I've been told that you should start reading my poems. It's going to be my poem then. But this is a poem by one of my favorite poets, Ada Lamone. If you have 
had classes with me before, you probably do. It's just like like teaching and poetry in there. Uh, but this poem, it's from her, this is one of her earlier books it's called The Big Big World. And it's the last poem in her book. And it's called Epilogue. The object is to not simply exist in this world of radio clocks and moon pies and lunch breaks bring only relief from the machine that is our mind humming inside of its shell. Shouldn't we make a fire? And not wonder if we have a right to build without permission from the other little creatures. Out of this small plot we are given, small plot of cement and electrified wires, small plot of razors and outlandish liquor names, let's make a nest, each of us, of our own pieces of glass and weeds and names we cut down. Somewhere along the banks of this liquid world, let all of us hold close to the law. In the unclear, and in our own odd little way, find some refuge here. We don't have this book to say one time, but you might need to All right, so let's go ahead and get into our kids, yeah? Yeah, all right. Um, I was told I could do it kind of in the and they not very imaginative about such things, but I'll go to the last name. And I will introduce each reader, uh, and they will have about 15 minutes or so to, to read their work and to see what they do. So, welcome to Halloween, whatever you feel like doing. Like the poetry, I know you're going to love all of it. Uh, so, we'll go ahead and I will introduce them. And the first one up is going to be Ryan Collins. And Ryan Collins is the author of the New American Field Guide and Song Book and several chapbooks. His poems have appeared in another Chicago magazine, a symptom to Crazy Horse Diagram, and series in my Island University. And if you want to say a few words about the Midwest Writing Center, I know you can do it in your sleep. Thank you much, Ryan. Uh, welcome, Ryan. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for coming. Thanks uh, for putting this together. It's cool uh, to read the same Andrews and not just teach. English 101, which is usually what I do when I'm in campus, uh, which is also very cool, don't get me wrong. Um, uh, Midwest Training Center, uh, what we do, we are the only literary arts nonprofit uh, in the Quad City area. Uh, we do anything and everything related to writing, lots of workshops, lots of uh, youth programming, which is why I didn't, I met you through here. Uh, but then, obviously, we, you know, I've been. Seminars and uh, um, we have an annual conference, which for many years we call here. The last two years, obviously, we have been able to do it in person the way that we would like. So we have been doing it virtually. We're hoping to kind of do it kind uh, of maybe hybrid, maybe some of it in person. I'm not exactly sure we're figuring it out as we go. We kind of want to think that that goes for a lot of things. Um, but we have information out there if you want to find out more information and talk to me about the brochure on the way out there. Um, yeah, do you got ideas on programs that we should do? There's a couple of and people partner. Any friends in there? It's lots of friends in there. friends. Yeah, I won't share that. <laughs> names, you know, people. But I'm very, very grateful uh, before I start reading poems to, to be here in the space with all of you who do a live poetry reading for some time, which is just amazing because I've been doing this on Zoom. For a year and a half, and it was just really good to be. I mean, we did some other events this summer, but it was good to be in the poetry and meet with you all. Um, and thank you for the broadside. I've never had a broadside done in my poems in any fashion, so thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, and to read with these two readers, Aubrey, that I've known for years, and had a lot of good fortune to work with, and I've been groups with, and have known and uh, appreciated the poems for a long time. It's 
of less injury with you. And Elena, yeah, so Elena was my student, and I went one one last fall, and that was very, very hard, very hard way to start your college career, just with being online and everything being so terrible. And then Elena took a, a poetry workshop that I taught, which I mean, was also in uh, last winter, and then over the summer, I was in the Young, young Regenerative Summer Internship Program that I've known for several years. Uh, and her work is featured in the Atlas, which is also up there that you can buy. Um, I'm, I was going to do the same thing. I'm going to, I don't have nice poems to um, So in lieu of starting with nice things, I guess I'll start with better than to one of my favorite poems um, that's just stayed with me for a very long time. And kind of found. I think sometimes the poems that mean most to us find us at the right time and kind of like sort of cute ways. And that's definitely how this came to me. Uh, I first came across this poem when I was an undergrad at the University of Iowa. Uh, it's uh, the first poem in the book, Enola Gay, by the poet Mark Levine. Um, he teaches at the Writers Workshop with Paul, I think he's still there, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, book was published by University of California Press in 2000, so it's a bit of an oldie, but definitely a goodie. Uh, by Mark Levine. And for the second, Many nights he strayed into the vacant church and he kneeled in the aisle with his hands in his shirt and he remembered the song he wished not to remember. He remembered and he sang. And though the words were not familiar, he kept singing and he faced the fake cans and tar paper and wires worn out. He would have lit a candle had one been provided, but he had no gestures to give. Only the song, his disjointed verse, he repeated, and he wondered how many more nights his mission would last. There was a magnet in his pocket and a hammer in his pocket, and he could hear bats or mice or pigeons or maybe all three in the decayed choir walk. He could hear the sound of the one train that came through each night with its cargo rattling on rattling flatbeds. He missed his mother. He would look for her still in the green of Lydia's woods. And he would sing the song that her long absence implied that his voice was not good and even he distrusted his voice. From a nail on a mural that he guessed was left behind by a migrant worker squatting in the church. leaves in a corner shadow of a figure. He hadn't meant on, he hadn't meant to go on so long. He hadn't meant it. The song would not go, and the words no longer sounded like words, but he sang with his tongue behind his teeth, but he struggled to remove his hands from his shirt. Thanks, Mark Levine, for one of those poems. I'm going to read the, the poem of Joseph Bronze. Um, there's nothing to know about this poem, but it's called Be Safe and Be Minor. Uh, 
sorry, you better hear this. Uh, I've, I've been working on this series of protocols for a long time uh, that are all sort of like a reimagining of uh, the never ending story. The never ending story. Yes. Cool. Keep that one sure. It's terrific. Um, and sort of uh, in eco poetics, it's sort of imagining uh, the big heavy in the, in the never ending story, which is the nothing, which is formless, shapeless, has no voice. No, no, not just it is this is the battle in the world uh, due to a lack of uh, human imagination, particularly among adults. Um, so I kind of took that and was thinking about the sort of planet crisis and, and how much of that um, is a result of people just not being able to conceive of it. They know it's happening and they have evidence, but you can't sort of see something. It's like a hyper object. It's like two different people in the mind at once. So that's kind of where I was coming from. That. That's a lot to say about that short poem. Um, this is, uh, yeah, this is uh, one of the one sentence poems. Um, and it's coming out in a magazine uh, called Mag, which is which is published in the UK, and it's actually my first international publication. So. And rivers reverse its flow uphill to re up the fresh water reservoirs for the next great thirst or refill the fallen clouds spilling out of our bowls. Mm -hmm. I write short poems mostly. Um, I'm going to read from the longest poem I've ever written uh, soon. Uh, but mostly I write a <laughs> poem. So I'm going to uh, read another one sentence poem. Uh, this appeared in a magazine called Apartment. Um, it borrows a sentence from a Belarusian chef in Anna uh, I can't remember the document. I think it's a chef's table or something like that. She's been one of those people by one of my And it's a love poem. Uh, and it's called Gold Leaves Kit Catastrophe. Wildness, a luxury, our mild palates most prized. Not a canopy of tasteless so called precious metal, pressed thinner than a fingernail, and draped over an aerated mirror, an oxygen starved mess of dreams, acclimated more to sea level than miles high, but sweeter and more intense thanks to the climbing elevation, the drastic fall in air temperature from one end of the balanced egg to another. Because of love, sometimes we create catastrophes on both frozen ends of spring, growth seasons of unsown seeds locked under falling permafrost and behind prayer. Mm -hmm. um, um, this one's a true story. Um, it's about a conversation I had up front with a friend of mine. Uh, it's in the military, apparently in the military, you can set up shots. Um, they don't necessarily tell you what the vaccination is doing, so they don't tell them, they don't know. And uh, as a result of this experience, he was, uh, how do you say, a uh, vaccination at first. Um, yeah, not like they don't pull the trigger and they just know the whole screen. So I run this about a conversation that he had, he's sort of thinking about all the things that he also had to do with the screen, also including um, a little thing kit. Uh, and Sir John Balzac. So, uh, this is speaking of an old friend of the play. The phone rings and no conspiracy awaits on the other end, other than grief and a hard sun falling over or catching up. But to where and with whom as yet I'm here, trying to hear a reflection of myself in the voice of a friend, or at least once a friend now. To be sure, but the means in what space, screen to screen, or voice and face to face, the tired of a whole year without friends embraces the room's cold light of a lump and a throat that hasn't cleared since so many passed. My best friend John, who wasted and died in my arms, and how not to be reminded of grief with every breath anymore. Feels less clean, like the handshakes and hugs once so freely given to people we've never really seen until at some move 
of chilling the summer when singing around me like a bell, a tongue hanging on and on with a single only note. One more poem. I don't want to apologize and make sure my feet are like far along. I don't have ever written or like showed anyone. Um, uh, just thinking about the, 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 the theme for the event, I'm thinking about community. This, this poem is written for two people to me, uh, who to me uh, represent um, the best of the creative community around here and create a place where a bunch of that creative community can come together and do a lot of amazing things and literally welcomes in performers from all over the world uh, and brings them here to other little small corner of that world uh, and makes it more magical as a result. And if you don't know, I'm talking about Ross Tox, uh, which is in Rock Island, which is a total gift from Los Angeles, a place that has something to Ross Tox. Um, the poem is called A Little More Blue, uh, which is the moniker that Benjamin Fox, who's the owner and proprietor of Ross Tox and Bird Farm. Um, that's the moniker under which he DJs. Uh, this poem, the first draft of this poem, was written at Glass Tops in one sitting uh, on the first night that he played over that monitor, which was also, I believe, very near the key year anniversary of his mother's passing. Uh, the poem is dedicated to his mother, Marissa Missy Sorrels, who um, passed away in 2017. So, uh, and uh, the only other thing that you need to know, a hyperania is a very, very delicious alcoholic beverage. Uh, if you're not familiar, and it's very summer and wonderful. Um, Jasa, lime juice, ice, and a little bit of sugar. Um, and for those who are interested, great <laughs> um, So, this is for Ben, and this is for uh, Missy, um, and this is a little more good. Thanks, everybody. A little less anger and a little more winter fills two old fashioned glasses of summertime drinks and crushed ice under the tomato lantern light in a room with the most elegant music selection for a thousand miles. A little more winter and a little less blue opens like a book and finish a story abandoned for damn near almost 10 months and 10 days and so long. Rising like a Scorpio moon, a room half full and waxing with sitar trip hop and drum loops and trance spells, pre millennial tension wire insulated by air, a little less blue and a little more feedback. A network of constant humming strung together by loom and by turntable, the selector cross states in time and key, in time and key and the pressure drops a room. Pulsing in syncopation with the beats per minute, the projector clipping on a heather gray strap of screen, not an overmantle, not a music version of exit music from a film, not a movie, not a cult, not a classic, not an optical illusion, not a composite room, green and empty and shaded with data, a little more feedback and a little less silence. Our most desperate choices sound trapped. Our lives more than empty backgrounds catching a trick, blueberry light. Our lives cast more than silhouettes. Our choices trace and cut out. Every choice makes us more vulnerable, and our vulnerabilities are contests we hold between ourselves and each other. A little less silence and a little more sugar. Not as tender as the natural rests comfortably fit inside pockets of conversation, detached from a steady tempo. Under the lowest ends of welcome hypnosis and hip shapes, shared around and outside and in the walls, passing through a doorway in both directions at once. Under the flickering cupcake neon sign, the awnings and pictures, pictures shudder when someone new enters the room, when one song transitions into the next, the inexorable blur and blend of the lives of people captured in song and in prayer, a steady revolution in the lives of a person, spinning the gravity strong enough to hold the atmosphere in place. A little more sugar and a little less shame scores our most vulnerable moments desperate for music to move us to, move us to smooth over our rough surfaces, a little, a little less shame and a little more citrus. We keep the room warm between a needle and an arterial groove Warm with lava lamp conversations, with a blue summerness sunset, 
when each entrance and exit the door opens and takes the gulf of almost our fifth November night. After 10 months and 10 days later, give or take two years, still our grief and reason continue. But if when we listen to enough music, you know there's no such thing as enough music. And when, if we listen to enough bright, blood bruised corners of the world, we ought to better understand music exists to apprehend us, to remind us the grieving continues forever at different frequencies and different ways. Music renders blue from a green emptiness, a little more citrus and a little less lonely. Moments like voids between ice cubes melting in summer and the last Pecorania, and the emptiness above its surface tension like a clear sky over a cold steepness, filling up a glass before leaving, before the end of the set, and a shadow of quiet leaving before we're ready, a silence satisfied with anything but nothing to say. Leaving before we're left alone and by ourselves, leaving before the last crushed mind quarters and dust of conversation melt and freeze the moonlight, too thin to escape. A little less lonely and a little more blue on such lucky, cloudless nights as these, we do our best to stay inside and dance. Thanks. Phantom Books Light and Chocolate. Uh, her work has appeared in Best Speed Poet, In Wheel, Anti, Matter, Hobart, Boot, We Madrid, El Ayla, Quarterly West, Diagram, the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, and elsewhere. Uh, her poems have been featured on Broadsides by Joseph Lassie and Teen Nerd Letter Press. Hubbard is the winner of the Booth Poetry Prize and has been three times nominated for a Pushcart Prize. And she lives in Iowa with her husband, too. Yeah. Welcome, Aubrey. Yeah. Hi, Hi. I'm so happy to be here and so honored to be with you. And Elena, um, so I've been thinking about this whole concept of opening with a happy poem. Um, <laughs> all of these, like I know, I said, I know. Um, and I have also been told I write different poems. <laughs> um, and I don't think I do. <laughs> but um, it makes me think about, so um, when I moved back to Pod City, it was over a decade ago. Um, and the, when I met Ryan, I was so lucky to come home and I didn't know that the Midwest I was going to be here. I didn't know if Ryan was here. I didn't know if Rob Fox was here. Um, and when I met Ryan, I was very sad of Kristen and very afraid. And I had a newborn um, and I was worried about the world. And when Ryan and I started to be able to be in poetry groups and meet each other at home, um, it was such a blessing. And he says he doesn't write happy poems. And I've been told I don't write happy poems, but they made me happy. <laughs> um, and you know, with this theme of rebuilding community, um, I do think a poem is a building, we build poems. Um, and Maybe we're building them out of our sadness, but maybe they're uh, not being <laughs> So I thought I would open with the first poem that I thought um, I had written, like a really happy poem that made me feel better. And it was the first poem that I was told. 
<laughs> um, and I was really lucky that this was made into a uh, grad site by the New York Times a long ago. So this is called Things to be Done. It isn't a matter of hope. In Bracken, a boy is stooped with the business at hand and singing in his head, Cecilia, you're breaking my heart, and he's gathering. He has gathered the most words he can for the night when the quake starts. When the rafters shake, someone is staying where he is, and he kneels in church until his knees feel like apples, and soon the rafters stop. They hold the sky up. A woman lays on his side in the field behind his house with the round glow of the belly tightening like a fist, and she remembers to get to her feet, to stand wide and plant her heels in the dirt and remembers to make a cathedral of her hips and push down toward the wet grass and toward the wet seas. It isn't a matter of hope. Let the earth take what it needs. So I think I'll read a couple other pieces both from um, this is a good piece, and then I love to read them from Flyer. I really like writing for this. Um, so these are also the same. Um, so um, this is called a spell for one who daydreams of horror. Three militiamen in matching tan and the timber of their knots at nine, just after dark, just after my baby is asleep. Sometimes he hears them bark his father's name and he wakes and their eyes roll right to the door. Sometimes he sleeps and wakes to quiet, and that's much worse. I'm tired of apocalypse, of living dead, of news, of detailed news. Let God put lips against my temple, blow me clean, a full moon skull. I call them pine and lake, the sky and its pewter bowl. In my skull, fill up a basket, his mouth taking milk and seed, their branch and then a hundred birds in one small tree. And he is telling me, birds. One last one from this collection is called The Feast at the End of the World. I've been unmade, a jar of evil flour and the dust storm husk of beauty. Feed grain, ethanol. My land is a warlord. My land is strip, mine, and mall. Lord, just give me cow shit and cover crop, and I'll be a feet beneath the deep red sun. I'll be a fat feet, knifing the dark and dreadlocked with loam. Give me hive, grown clean, boards from a red rotten barn. When the stores shut down, when the shelves are all clean lines of beautiful mouths, let me be bright as a buck hunted down. We're only bone and a wild ride of bread. Holy blood, holy tongue. We crack so fast, then blade like eggs. We blade, we feed the young. So I'm going to read a little bit of choir. The Midwest Studying Center published, and I such a beautiful lesson. So um, I know this the construction of it. <laughs> I'm so thankful um, to be a part of and that you do. Um, so this whole book came about as a project between the artist Anna Richardson, who is um, just a black white um, and she is an incredible painter. And she and I were looking at these old myths and fairy tales um, that feature women that are um, sort of monstrous. 
And so we were trying to look at these stories and um, figure out where the monster came from and who really is a monster. Um, and the first one that we did, so Anna would make a painting of the story and then I would write a poem or vice versa. Um, and the first one we did was and it's because we read this article about the origin story of the um, So we all know her as monsters, gems, and stones, snakes for hair. Um, but if her origin story is that she was immortal and she um, was an acolyte in a temple and she was raped by Poseidon. And because she was supposed to remain a virgin, um, and she was not any longer, she was punished for the snakes. Um, so that's something. <laughs> so uh, this is called Medusa talking of snakes. I shut stuck vine tugged in ripples incrementally. This and the mind also a muscle, unsynchronized. In sun, they still and school themselves. The sun fierce on slate, and the slate like a great brittle. They are toothed, I think, but they are my children. When my skull is a cradle, I think monsters, and what can be done to monsters. Once in the temple, I laughed all purpose. When visited by God, according to a God's purpose. This snake, gorgeous and speaking from my throat. Look, I'm an emerald thing, and there is an origin before the story of the origin. Right at the shadow skin, shouldered off. So, what I would like to do um, this phone call to you. Um, that I wrote after finding out that um, I heard a new story about how they discovered that jellyfish sleep, that they sleep and awake, but they don't, the jellyfish don't sleep, but they say they sleep in the same thing. So um, this is called Sleep Sleep. Weave a nightlight with multiple settings, neon to neon in sliding heat. I imagine the jellyfish which is to sleep like this. First, some peach, then aquamarine. When I say I want to be brainless, I mean my own is without lull, jalopy and ratchet. I shower for silence, static, and there I think salinity. Which man will own which aquifer? Which catchment system will keep us in green? Every time I dream and photo, I go chicken shit and quick to saw rhyme, quick to kowtow, and the ring is a hot potato. So there's a state. I think we're all here in Germany. I think I'm making of my children two white houses, bright with spears. I want to look through my skin and see the ocean, the way jellyfish can see the ocean, absent. A thing they see. Where I plant kale, there used to be an entity we all call them, every luminous thing intact. Mm -hmm. I wanted to answer the um, reading to see if we were going to, like, if we were. On the theme, and I'm noticing that we're, we've got some of the same things within the the offices. I am going to close with um, 
the poem that Ryan, I was going to make sure included in Little Essay. And yeah, and just again, thank you so much for being here. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Um, this is called I Am Telling You Story. I am telling you story. Believe me, you were in your home, in the kitchen of your home, a stove full of log and a story. Once there was a woman whose belly surged like the long horizon, and she fell from the sky and gave birth to land. Once we were dirt, once salt of sea. Does this help your heart? Do you hear like me for your When no one knows, telling you story. The sky woman died and her heart became buried. Someday you'll be so old, your hands are crossed between roots and sparrows. You'll have enough wood or you will not. Your children will grow or they will not. Here, a story where there, they are men with hands and lungs, blue stem and dot. Here is a story. You are a prairie where your children stand rowdy for the sun. You are old and they lay you down. Your ribs cuddle open on the prairie, and where once was your heart is a bird telling stories. Children once the earth here that made you. I, you know, I always uh, read Aubrey's poems or listen to them. I always feel cool. It's like physical noise. But something I love about Ryan's poetry and uh, Aubrey's and the uh, world is it does the stuff that the best poetry should do, I think, which is make you see something. That's usually familiar to you, but in a way that just kind of startles you or floors you. And I, I feel like I'm doing that thing with this poem. So I think we did something like that. So, our third and final reader tonight is Elena Blanco. She's a sophomore student at St. Andrews University with a love for the arts. Although she is studying theater, uh, and she's in theater, she's in OC. She's in Play, but really, go see she's so awesome. You haven't seen it. So she's studying theater and early childhood education, uh, and writing is a huge passion in her life. Elena writes for the Love Girls magazine, the SAU newspaper, uh, the SAU theater newsletter, and has a fascination with the art of poetry, in which she was published for the first time this summer through the Midwest Writing Center's Young Emerging Writers Done a lot of these readings, so you know, but I'm here. <laughs> um, this first poem, I'm gonna kind of let it do its thing and introduce me. Um, it's called Dear Strangers, Please Read This So You Know What You're Getting Yourself Into. <laughs> Two minutes is not enough time to write about almost 20 years of trials and tribulations and trauma, but for you, I'll try. I like alliteration because I can feel the words on my tongue. I think roller coasters are fun, but not as much as the adventures of mouth and mind. I don't like beaches or pools or dipping my toes into anything new. I think the word chubby should stop being used as a derogatory term. I mean, I am chubby, but that just means there's more of me to love. I don't drink enough water, so if I were a flower, I'd be a wilted one. I have an obsessive personality that often leads to loneliness. I've been sleeping with the lights on, which is a bit of a weird habit to have because I'm not afraid of the dark. 
I'm pretty sure. I should probably write about my dad, but it's never the right time. I never say no, which is a bit of a dangerous game. I spend a lot of time writing love poems to future men when I should be writing them to myself. My little name is the letter D and it stands for disorder, dysfunction, and delusion. Sometimes <laughs> it seems like not only does my brain want me to have a bad day, but the universe does too. I don't like writing poems that use I. I would rather use she. She doesn't have anything to hide. I don't understand how bridges work, but maybe that's because I'm not stable, especially not in muddy waters. One time I watched my sister almost die and I've been fucked up ever since. So, um, doesn't make any sense, but the world does. I'm not writing. This next one I also wrote this summer. It was uh, part of the Quad City Arts um, Youth Metro. That's not the name of that. I totally butchered that, but <laughs> their poetry thing. Um, it's called This Is Not a Love Poem. Roses are red. Roses are red and violets are blue. Roses are red and violets are blue, and this is not a love poem. Roses are red and violets are blue, and this is not a love poem because I am not in love. I'm not in love, and I don't have anyone to write love poems to. I'm not in love, and I don't have anyone or anything to write love poems to. Well, that's a lie. There are a lot of things I could write love poems to. I could write love poems to the earth. I could write love poems to the earth or to the sun. I could write love poems to the earth or to the sun or to donuts. <laughs> to the earth or to the sun or to donuts or to each new day. I could write love poems to the earth or to the sun or to donuts or to each new day or to future lovers or to myself. Myself. I could write love poems to myself. I could write love poems to myself, but that's a hard thing to do. I could write love poems to myself, but that's a hard thing to do. And like I said, this is not a love poem. <laughs> this next piece is entitled My New Companion. Last night, I sat outside and cried with the shadows. We bonded over things like lost dreams and broken love. Our tears drowned the blades of grass and began to suffocate the earth. Now she is one with her mind. Keep turning until the brightness fades or until you can't get out of bed anymore. The earth's bed is the sky. Mine is made of metal. Trapped in sheets, sewn to the mattress. Shadows are there too. They play with my imagination. Friendly confusion. Friendly illusions. They like the nighttime, and so do I. It's where lonely minds lie. They see me, antique treasure, hard to find, easy to keep, rusted and dusty. Shadows, they plan on staying for a while, but I don't mind the company. <laughs> This next piece is entitled Caged Animal Spring. Um, just a little warning, this piece does talk about self-harm a little bit. It talks about um, institutions for mental health and things like that. So please take care of yourself if you need to be your way more important than a poem I could write. So, Caged Animal Spring. Caged Animal Spring, and so does the mind. We aren't that different. Eat, sleep, wake, shake, panic, breathe, repeat. Illnesses melded into public exhibits, brokenness put on display. Being attractive and being an attraction are not the same. No more than just daytime entertainment. By night, we are left in the cold and led to self inflicted pain. Our personal 
and facilities, they rehabilitate us, metal bars make our beds, captivity becomes a habitat. Visitors beware. They try to control us, but animals fight. Aggression is our mating call. Don't roar too much, the loud ones are given a sedative to prescriptions, come as dinner or just a side. Our keepers have PhDs earned by staring through glass, but they don't know how it feels to be bred for disorder. Mm -hmm. more for you. I promise that after this thing, we'll get a little bit happier. <laughs> <laughs> I did it kind of the opposite way. So let's start, you know, <laughs> build up to brighter days. Um, so this poem is called Don't Try This at Home, a list of things I want. And this one is the self-harm and suicidal ideation. So again, you need to step out feel free. Don't try this at home, a list of things I want. I want to do dangerous things with these parts of fingers and hands, to carve myself like a pumpkin, up, down, up, down, making a pattern out of this self-persecution, a bloody blueprint. To claw at the skin layers and layers, to rip and tear from its root, and cover the sorrow soul beneath, to pick and pinch and pull my face, Rearrange it to feel the power, destruction flow through my veins and I wilt away. I want again to feel something. <laughs> this one is titled Broken Minds and Love. Broken minds can't love, not fully, at least. Not fully, not until cracks are filled. Not fully, at least not until cracks are filled with the cements of life. Broken minds can't love, not fully, at least not until the cracks are filled with the cements of life and sealed over. Can't love, not fully, at least not until the cracks are filled with the cements of life and sealed over with healing. They can't love, they can't love, they can't love. Broken minds can't love until they are reopened and sealed once again. Broken minds can't love until they are reopened and sealed again. Sealed again because they are no longer broken. Because they are no longer broken and because they know how to grow with the scars. They are no longer broken and they know how to grow with the scars. Because broken minds are better now. Sit by the river, dreaming together at the sunset serenades us, eating strawberries and having nowhere to put the stems. You look at me with brown eyes, face a sort of sentimental beige. Our minds dance together, writing love letters in the sky, thoughts and feelings trace into the clouds, cheekbones push against each other's skin, sweet whispers of passion. Evening crawls across the sky, reminding us the world is waiting. We pack our things and plan for the next sunset. We are an unfinished poem, adding new beauty each day. We have one last one, it's a little bit longer, um, so we also keep it in the atlas. It's called Connect to the Earth. Um, it's one of my favorites, I don't know, I love it, so here it is. Connect to the earth. Each body takes from it, and in the same instance, adds to it. Each of us takes a breath. Atmosphere. Once in time, create existence as well as the past. 
all we can do is keep living for everything around us keeps us moving, moving in space, someone else's space, you no, know, our collective space. Dreams and the lights fill the sky. Each star blows a gentle kiss of hope. The moonshine paints the grass back to earth. Notice how each blade moves. Earth's music. Please watch your step. I watch the rain dance in the rain. The droplets kiss my skin and whisper revival as they roll down. Morning dew on the grass. I am not alone. My reflection is all around. My smile and the sunshine are hair in the wind. My aspirations dance with the clouds. I am less than the whole that the earth still shows me her love. Her rotation is the ignition for life. Listen. She sings us lullabies. I can hear it. Bird songs, wind chimes, earth's beautiful rainbow, sensations of sound. Hear her stories and write your own. Write letters to the earth, serenade her, but most of all, travel the earth. She sees herself as beautiful and so should you. Without your eyes, her beauty would be unseen. Without her body, you would not have been birth. Heredity. Amazing sights out the passenger window or the drivers of the vehicle. You live in memories if you are continuously being connected. Wait. Listen to the earth as she comes alive with the voices. Voices, voices of you, of me, of him, her, they, and she. Keep moving, keep listening. Get lost in the oceans, let go on dusty roads. Visit each flower and garden and root and vine. Travel to the middle of nowhere. Find the beginning and the end of nowhere, too. Live in the sunshine, survive off the rain. Our mother will provide for you. Just ask for help. Generation. Grandma, stop gardening. We'll visit the flowers, befriend them, and bring them back home. Come home to the field, stay a while, reconnect with Mother Nature, fool the past, and become a child again. Play in the Earth's classroom, explore, learn, and grow and be human. Grow to her roots and find yours too. She sees me again, the Earth, I mean. The Earth is beauty and I am her mirror. My oversized blue sweater is now covered with clouds, ocean waves curve like a silhouette and sandy skin covers my bones. Dark soil mixes in with my hair. Lay down deep in the earth. Life becomes a memory. Breathe. Relax. Let go. Rest in peace. And finally, become one with her. Thank you. Right. Sad that we don't have any more readers, but also not because that wasn't the perfect way, I think, to end things. Your, your reading style is so musical. All right, well, that's, that's everything. Can we give it up for more time for all three minutes?